There is no they with a capital T out there that's going to fix this. I think even I fell into that trap after Sandy Hook thinking, oh my gosh, this is so horrible. This can't continue to go on. Yet it is because there is no they with a capital T that's going to fix this. We are going to have to be the ones that fix this. And thankfully there is a solution. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And it's called social and emotional learning. Social emotional learning is simply teaching us how to have healthy and positive relationships, deep and meaningful connections, skills and tools for resilience, how to manage our emotions and conflict, just to name a few things. And as educators that are teaching this, it's an opportunity for you to learn them as well and for them to positively impact you as an educator, as an individual, as a parent, as a friend, and as a human being. Social emotional learning is actually the number one way to have a safe school. Wait a minute, what is she talking about? What about all the external safety measures like active shooter protocols, arming, not arming school resource officers, single point entries and such? Well, those are very important, unfortunately. We need those today. However, those are all external safety measures. None of that addresses the cause of why a child or anyone else would want to harm themselves or someone else. Social emotional learning does this and you actually need to address the external and internal safety measures in order to have a comprehensive school safety plan. Social emotional learning is also the number one way to proactively prevent mental illness. We know that kids that are taught social emotional learning skills, tools, and attitudes in the classroom have reduced and prevented mental illness for the rest of their life. We know that social emotional learning is the number one way to improve the climate and culture of a school. Two buzzwords that we're talking about. Social emotional learning is the number one way to improve these. Social emotional learning is the number one attribute wanted by top employers. They work better in groups. They're more creative. They're better employees overall. I have universities contacting me, asking me to create a Choose Love program for their incoming freshmen. They say to me, these kids are so bright. They have the grades and test scores to get in, but they don't have the emotional intelligence to stay in or to take advantage of everything that we offer. So we know that social emotional learning is the number one way to break the generational cycle of dysfunction. So we know through research that when you have dysfunction in your family, that can go out seven generations. I actually don't know any other way to break that cycle except to teach kids these skills, tools, and attitudes that will enable them to overcome the dysfunction. We also know that social emotional learning is the number one way to reduce taxes. Wait a minute, you say, now she's gone way too far. Reduce taxes, what does she mean by that? Well, think about how much money we spend as taxpayers, just focusing on the negative and the symptoms, not on solutions. The latest estimate out of the White House for the opioid epidemic is tens of billions of dollars. Where does that money come from? And it's perfect every time I ask that question, I either have a pocket that's sewed shut or really tiny or actually no pockets at all because that money comes directly from us. How about spending a fraction of that amount to proactively reduce and prevent the suffering before it even starts? We know that we can do that through social and emotional learning. What is social and emotional learning? Social emotional learning has five core components. Self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. It's best when taught in classrooms and in the home and community. We really need to have a consistent message from school all the way through to community. I think you heard me say there were decades of research, 100% of which has come out in support 
of teaching kids social emotional learning in classrooms. We know that kids that have social emotional learning in classrooms get better grades and test scores right off the bat. We know that they have higher graduation rates, higher attendance rates. We know that they have a decrease in emotional distress, better classroom and school climate, increased positive relationships and connection, less stress and anxiety, less behavioral issues, even less bullying. Now there are long-term studies that have followed kids from kindergarten all the way into adulthood. What have these studies found? They found that kids that had social emotional learning had less substance abuse, less mental illness of all kinds, less incarceration, less violence and anger, even less divorce rates. There are even economic and public health implications for social and emotional learning. We know that for every dollar invested in social emotional learning, there is an $11 net present value return to the community. That is from a Columbia University study done in 2015. That means that social emotional learning is actually a money maker. Think about how much money we would save as taxpayers if we proactively reduced and prevented mental health issues, incarceration, substance abuse, so many things. So much suffering could be reduced and prevented with social and emotional learning. So when does teaching begin? Is it in the classroom when all the kids are sitting down in class ready for their teacher to get up there and to learn their lesson? Actually, teaching begins before that. It begins in preparing the kids to get ready to learn. Because kids that come to the classroom traumatized, anxious, upset, are not going to be able to be present to learn. So social emotional learning actually helps kids to prepare their innermost attitude for learning. Let's actually look at a study that followed 800 children over 20 years. This was published in the American Journal of Public Health in December of 2016. This study found for every one point increase in a child's social competency score in kindergarten, they were twice as likely to obtain a college degree and 46% more likely to have a full-time job by the age of 25. Conversely, for every one point decrease in a child's social skill score in kindergarten, he or she had a 67% higher chance of having been arrested in early adulthood, a 52% higher rate of binge drinking, and an 82% higher chance of being in or on a waiting list for public housing. The takeaway is that social emotional learning provides dramatic impact on a child's entire life but also on society as a whole. The Choose Love Enrichment Program has fabulous resources and I hope that you'll download and look at them all. Great videos, we have a YouTube channel, we've got great posters that you can hang in your classroom and many, many more resources. We also have wonderful extension programs, some of which are focused on trauma. The Choose Love Enrichment Program is now being taught in all 50 states and downloaded in over 67 countries. This is incredible because this is all by word of mouth. It's very easy to download the program. You just go to our website, jessielewischooselove.org. Jesse Lewis spelled J-E-S-S-E-L-E-W-I-S. You can register by putting in your first and last name and email address and then you can start the download process. There are four units for each grade level and four to six lessons per unit. The four units are the same in elementary, middle, and high school, and they are the character values of the formula for choosing love. So they are courage plus gratitude plus forgiveness plus compassion and action equals choosing love. So the middle school is 6th, 7th, and 8th. Every week starts with a brain blast, which is about 20 to 30 minutes. And then each day for the rest of the week is a power surge, which is a shorter lesson. So these lessons are built to go into advisory, morning meeting. They don't take a lot of time and they're fun and they're built so that the educator learns right alongside the student. 
So the high school breakdown is 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. So there are 28 lessons total and seven lessons per unit. Again, built to go right into advisory. We have great supplemental materials, and I really want to give a shout out to our educator guide that has tremendous information in it. Make sure that you download it and take a look. We have common elements between all of the grade levels that are scaffolded up. So the program is really meant to be taught pre-K through 12th grade, but you can jump in at any time because each grade level is standalone as well. But the common elements amongst the grade levels really give this connecting element for children. So we've literally seen elementary kids now having something to talk about between the grade levels and it's really brought schools together. The bottom line is this, we want to create a culture of choosing love. We want the educators and kids, administration and staff to set the intention and model choosing love. It's really important that we practice these concepts every single day in almost everything that we do because when the words that come out of our mouth match our actions, that is modeling and it's very powerful to kids. The kids will sign a pledge that we call the Constitution, similar to the oath that you'll download um, when you download your program. So the kids get to come up with what they want the classroom to look like, and that's very empowering to them. The Choose Love program is also utilized in other areas of the school, morning announcements, class projects. You make it become a way of life. I love this quote by a Choose Love educator. This is more than a program. This is a culture shift. Anyone can implement the program. Choosing love is the basis of what we do with every decision that we make on a daily basis, right? In every interaction, we are choosing how we treat people. When we treat people with love, it feels good for us and for them, and we're making the world a better place. And there's a ripple effect with that. Here's some feedback from some littles that I had to include because it's so cute. Out of all the hearts, only one is the best. And then there's that little logo heart drawn by kindergartners. And that's not an easy logo to draw. We also have a Choose Love at Home program. This is a video-based program that corresponds with what we're teaching the kids in schools for parents so that everyone can be on the same page educators, students, and parents working towards the same goal of choosing love. Here are the results from a May 2018 survey. 99% of educators that responded said they saw an improvement in classroom climate. 98% said they saw an improvement in students' overall behavior. 73% said that their students got along better. 83% said their students have a more positive attitude, and 66% saw an increase in academic performance in their students. How can they be so rock star? I think it's because we teach this empowering concept that choosing love, this element that we all want and need as human beings, is a choice. Become a choose love leader. There's online training. If you feel like you need a little bit more following this video, we have free training online. And of course, our staff is always available to you to answer any questions. We also have Social and Emotional Learning Awareness Week. This is the week before Valentine's Day, culminating on Valentine's Day. Uh, Social Emotional Learning Awareness Week is a proclamation made actually by the state of Connecticut, but now all states have kicked in where students recognize the importance of social emotional learning and choosing love. So be on the lookout in newsletters for what the theme will be this year, and we would love for you to participate. In past years, we've done murals that have been taken and shown in uh, installations in Washington, D.C. We've had kids write essays that have become part of the congressional record, so part of America's permanent history. So we're thinking of something really exciting for the next Social and Emotional Learning Awareness Week. So as human beings, we're actually wired to connect. We have mirror neurons in our brains that help us to connect. When you're walking down the hall and you're having a great day and someone walks by you and they give you a dirty look, does that bother you? Yeah, it does. It hits you right here. 
However, we have to learn the skills and tools that help us connect on a deep and meaningful and healthy level. Harvard University did a 75 year longitudinal study. They wanted to find out what is the secret to happiness. You know what they found? It was positive relationships and deep and meaningful connections. Social emotional learning gives us the skills and tools to be able to have those meaningful connections and deep relationships. I was actually at a statewide school counseling conference a few summers ago, and there was a director of drug enforcement that was there giving the keynote speech. He said, and I'll never forget, we are losing the war on drugs. We realize now we can't arrest our way out of this problem, so we are coming to events like this and asking you for help. Then his counterpart got up and said something that blew me away and started to speak my language. She said, the opposite of addiction is connection, and connection is love. I learned that connection was love by talking to little school kids. So I can get little kids together in a room and speak to them, and I will say, what does anger feel like in your body? And I get, blah, headache, inferno, fire, stomach ache. And then I say, what does choosing love look like? And immediately, without thinking about it, and they're not necessarily sitting next to their best friend, they turn to each other and they do this. Or if they're sitting across from tables, they do this. And I learned from them that love is connection. And the opposite of addiction is connection. But we have to learn how to connect on a deep and meaningful level. So now let me introduce Jesse because he's the genesis of all of this. This is Jesse McCord Lewis, and this is his first grade class picture taken October 23rd, 2012, a little less than two months before his murder. The best way to describe Jesse was to say he was born 11 pounds. Yes, that's right. There's a picture to prove it. And uh, the first time I actually saw him, I was walking up to the nursery to, to meet him, and there were nurses gathered around the nursery window taking pictures. And I walked up behind them and I said, what are you taking pictures of? And they said, there is this enormous baby and he's trying to crawl out of his bassinet. And there was Jesse, you know, the clear plastic bassinets. He'd crawled down to the bottom and he was trying to crawl out less than 24 hours old. So that's a great way to describe him because that's how Jesse was for his full but short life. He was larger than life. He was always loud, always happy, always full of energy. Now Jesse's two favorite things were little yellow ducks that he would get at an arcade and little military men figurines that he would line up all over the place. In fact, I'm pretty sure that he planted them in our yard because they're still coming up. So when we wanted to create a logo and we knew we wanted to work in schools, we thought, okay, uh, we wanted to include something of Jesse. So yellow ducks, military men. Okay, we chose yellow ducks. But it's interesting where the military man thing comes in. For the first five and a half years of the Choose Love movement, our chairman of the board was a retired three-star Marine Lieutenant General. And he said that he has seen the worst of humanity through war. He did three tours in Vietnam, he did two tours in Iraq, and he said that he believed the only path to peace was through what we were doing at the Jesse Lewis Choose Love movement and social and emotional learning. So social emotional learning and choosing love helps us to gain positivity in our life. And by the way, it doesn't matter how old you are. And even if you're mm, generally a negative person and actually, and that's an interesting thing to say since the majority of all of our thoughts on a daily basis are negative, but when we focus on positivity, it broadens our perspective. It broadens our worldview. Anger and fear and negativity, narrow it. It's really interesting because there is a link in, in the latest positivity research between negativity and racism. When they fed their subjects negativity and then they showed them an image of a face of an opposite race, 
their subjects started to remember them as objects. When those same subjects were fed positivity, they began to look at faces of the opposite race as a whole. Positivity is incredibly important, and this is what we're here to talk about today as well. Here's an example. A beautiful day lily opens itself to the sun and closes itself to the darkness. That's what we do also with positivity and negativity. Positivity opens us up to greater perspective, to greater happiness. Negativity closes us off. So let's go into the formula for choosing love. Right now, I want everyone to walk away having this as a skill and tool in your belt that you can use that can help you choose love in any situation or circumstance. So our definition of courage is the willingness and ability to walk through obstacles despite feeling embarrassment, fear, reluctance, or uncertainty. So Jesse showed us a tremendous example of courage. For that act of bravery, Jesse was given a commander-in-chief funeral. A commander-in-chief funeral is reserved for heads of state and returning war heroes. And Jesse was considered a war hero because his first grade classroom was a literal war zone. Now, I talk about Jesse's courage, age appropriately, of course, because we all have this courage. Jesse was a six-year-old little boy. He doesn't have any courage that you don't have as well. We all have Jesse's courage, and hopefully, of course, we'll never be called on to, to lay down our lives for our friends, which is the ultimate form of courage, but it's the courage to be kind and gentle. It's the courage to tell the truth. It's the courage to do the right thing. By the way, these aren't just kid things. These are human things. It's the courage to practice each of the character values in the formula for choosing love. It's the courage to be grateful when things aren't going our way. It's the courage to forgive, especially when the person who hurt us isn't sorry. And it's the courage to step outside of our busyness and pain and help others. And when we do that, we're choosing love. But courage is actually like a muscle. First of all, we have to have an awareness that we have it, and then we have to practice it. And when you practice courage, it actually grows. This is all science. You know, the amazing thing to me is that the latest scientific research, the latest neuroscience, all leads us back to choosing love as being essential. Let's check out the scientific benefits of courage. These are all cited. Courage is confidence. It creates a sense of leadership. It enables us to be upstanders rather than bystanders that stand around and watch bad things happen. It makes us feel good. It helps us master our emotions. It empowers us to accomplish things and make good choices. Courage helps us to overcome fear and overconfidence which makes us take unnecessary risks. Courage supports us in finding balance with being able to thoughtfully respond instead of impetuously react. And courage helps to counter bullying. There's actually research that shows that when you have the courage to stand up to bullying behavior, that behavior stops within 10 seconds. And we've actually found that to be true with our kids that choose love. Now, why is it important to be aware of the benefits of doing something? Well, Harvard University did something called the MAID study in 2007. A researcher named Ellen Langer took two groups of hotel maids from different locations and brought them into a research center. She gave them all a thorough physical and then split them back into their two separate groups. She made one group mindfully aware of the benefits of being a hotel maid something that they were already doing. She said, you are a hotel maid, and by definition, you're active in your job. When you're active in your job, you have better heart health, better moods, you lose weight, etc." She told nothing to the control group. Then she sent the two sets of maids back to their separate locations for two months, and then brought them back to the research center and gave them the same thorough physical and lo and behold, the maids that had been made mindfully aware of the benefits of being a maid experienced those benefits exponentially more than the control group. What's the takeaway for us? The takeaway is that when we're aware of the benefits of something, we experience them on a deeper, more meaningful level. That's why it's really important to focus on 
understanding the benefits of something that you do. And that's why we focus on it in the Choose Love movement. So what does courage in counseling and education look like? Courage in counseling and education looks like being vulnerable, showing your true self, opening up a little bit to your classmates and to your peers. When we're vulnerable, that cultivates trust, right? And relationships, but it takes courage to be vulnerable. Another important thing about courage in the classroom is to be present with kids where they are. So it's not the, hey, how you doing? But maybe it's asking that question twice. Even if they say fine, they're gonna know that you had the courage to be present with them. It's making a meaningful connection with every single child every single day. It's being that trusted source for them. It's so incredibly important. You all are superheroes. You have the ability to transform and even save children's lives on a daily basis. And in fact, you do it. Gratitude is mindful thankfulness and the ability to be thankful even when things in life are challenging. So I was in 100% free and reduced lunch school the other day and these uh, second graders were choosing love and they were working on their gratitude list. And I looked over the second grader's shoulder and I had to snap this picture. Here is his gratitude list. And by the way, these kids uh, have breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the school and then they are given backpacks filled with food to take home over the weekend. So this little boy's gratitude list. Number one, I'm grateful for having a house when I'm not with my parents and for having foster parents. Number two, I'm thankful to eat every day. And he really is. I sent this picture to my team and I said, no one would blame this little boy for being angry and belligerent because clearly he has a lot going on, but instead he's focused on what he has. He's gonna be okay. Let's check out what the scientific benefits of practicing gratitude are. And there are so many emotional, social, career-wise, health-wise, personality-wise, and look what they all lead to, greater happiness. And by the way, that is something that connects us all as human beings as well. We all want to be happy. You know what my three favorite benefits of practicing gratitude are? Better sleep, <laughs> a strengthened immune system, and an elongated life. <laughs> but if, if those aren't enough for you, there are plenty of others. You know, people come up to me and they say, ah, oh, I have to take multiple kids to multiple sporting events. And then I have to go home and I have to do a huge pile of laundry for multiple kids. That sounds like a wonderful thing. I wish that I could do that. You get what I'm saying. Forgiveness. Forgiveness means choosing to let go of anger and resentment towards yourself or someone else, to surrender thoughts of revenge, and to move forward with your personal power intact. My new and improved definition is taking your personal power back. In some situations, forgiveness is the only way to do that. You know, I forgave the man who murdered my son and that was a way for me to cut the cord that attached me to pain. Let me explain. Before I forgave, I was angry and I was allowing this troubled young man who caused so much devastation to have power over my thoughts that impacted my feelings, that then impacted my behavior, and then rippled out to my family and friends. Really the only way for me to take my personal power back was to cut the cord that attached me to pain through forgiveness. But it doesn't mean that you don't fall back into anger. I think about Jesse's seventh birthday, which was about six months later, and I got up that morning and I was so incredibly angry. What happened? I should be celebrating my son's seventh birthday, yet instead I'm here alone and I was terribly angry, but that doesn't mean that I failed in my forgiveness. It means that I had to take a step back, take a deep breath and forgive again because forgiveness starts with a choice and then it becomes a process. And depending on what it is, it might be something that we have to do for the rest of our lives, but you know what, that's okay because it cuts the cord that attaches us to pain. Unless we choose to forgive, we're victims.
Let's look at the scientific benefits of forgiveness because there are decades of research that show the benefits to making the choice to forgive for us because forgiveness isn't forgetting. That would make it an immediate impossibility for me. It's not condoning what someone did. I will never condone what the shooter did at Sandy Hook Elementary School. And it doesn't even mean that you can't hold the person accountable. We're all responsible for our actions and our inactions. It simply means you're giving the gift of freedom to yourself. You're taking your personal power back. Let's check out what science says about this. Healthy relationships are the key to happiness. Remember, per the Harvard University 75 year longitudinal study, when we forgive, we have less anger. Studies show around 70% less anger, and I can tell you that that's true. When we forgive, we have greater physical and psychological well being, less anxiety, stress, and hostility, lower blood pressure, fewer symptoms of depression, a stronger immune system, improved heart health, higher self esteem. Forgiveness actually extends your lifespan. You know something has to be powerful if it extends your lifespan. What does forgiveness in counseling and education look like? I'm going to give you a line that I use a lot and you can use it now too. Everyone is doing the best that they can with the tools and skills that they have at that time. You know what? That statement is generally true. I know so much more now through social and emotional learning. And when I look back in my life, I realize that if I had these skills and tools, I would have handled myself much differently. But I can forgive myself because I didn't have the skills and tools. And you can look at other people in your life and you can say, if they knew better, they would do better. 99.999% of the time, that's true. And the 0.001% that it's not, it actually behooves you to think that it is. Let's go on to the last character value in the formula for choosing love. It's compassion in action. Compassion has two components. There's the identifying empathetic component, right? Think about how you felt when you watched that video of me and it showed clips of Jesse. How did that make you feel inside? pretty bad, right? In fact, hurtful. You might have even felt pain. Well, it's interesting because empathy lights up the same receptors in our brain as physical pain. So if you thought you felt pain, you actually did. Empathy is incredibly important in connection, but there is another component of compassion and it's the action component. That's when we actively do something to help ease that pain. And that's when all of what I say, the nurturing, healing, love that we give out, we get back. And that's backed up by research. A great example of this is JT, my son. He was in seventh grade and 12 years old when his little brother was murdered and he was understandably angry. In fact, he didn't want to go back to school and I didn't want him to go back to school. So uh, we suffered uh, alone for a bit until orphan genocide survivors from Rwanda reached out to him via live Skype and an interpreter. They said, JT, we heard about what happened to your little brother all the way over here in Rwanda. And we just wanted you to know that you're going to be okay and you're going to feel joy again. I remember standing behind him hearing those words and they were incredible because I knew that these now young adults had tremendous credibility because they had been through something almost worse than us. Then they started telling JT about their experience and it was horrific, but they started telling him also about how they overcame that experience and what they attributed their resilience to. And by the way, it was the same formula that Jesse had written on our kitchen chalkboard. They started feeling gratitude. They started, that gratitude actually strengthened them to consider forgiveness. And then when they chose to forgive, that gave them the strength to be able to step outside of their own pain, use their story to help others like they were doing with JT. JT turned around and went to school the next day and started an organization called Newtown Helps Rwanda. He started selling bands like this one 
and raising money to send those orphan genocide survivors to university. Within a few months, he was able to Skype back to that same group and announce that he'd raised enough money to send two of the orphan genocide survivors to university. Now he's helped countless severely traumatized kids in the U.S. He's built self-sustaining fish ponds for former children soldiers in Uganda, as well as poultry operations. And I'm watching this and learning, of course, because I'm always learning, but I'm watching JT heal himself by practicing compassion in action. In fact, compassion in action is more powerful than any pharmaceutical that we could take in its healing qualities. Let's check out what scientific research says about practicing compassion in action. When you practice compassion in action, it makes us happy. It releases oxytocin and other feel-good neurochemicals. When we do for others, it's good for our general health and well-being. It promotes cooperation, social and relationship skills. Doing for others cultivates social connection. It's fulfilling. What you give, you get back. Compassion in action evokes gratitude, and it's contagious. It creates a ripple effect and impacts so many others. Compassion in action counteracts depression, anger, and anxiety. It reduces and relieves stress and mentally stimulates. Doing for others increases our self-confidence and gives us a sense of purpose. We experience better physical and emotional pain management. When we do for others and practice compassion in action, it adds years to our life. Studies show a 22% reduction in mortality when we do for others. It's so incredibly powerful. What does compassion in counseling and education look like? Science has found that students who have caring relationships with educators are academically more successful and show greater pro-social behavior. And don't forget to practice self-compassion teachers. You know, like they say on the airlines, put on your oxygen mask before you put on your child's. You need to do that too. You need to practice compassion in action for yourselves. You have the most important job in the entire world. In fact, you're superheroes. So let's make this really simple, okay? Let's just break it down. We all just want to feel good, right? And we're going to do it in one of two ways, only one of two ways. And that's based on our awareness and education. So we're going to try to feel good by using anger. Mm, think about it. Anger gives us a shot of adrenaline and it actually makes us feel a little powerful, doesn't it? Maybe you reach back for a little shot of self-righteous indignation. I'm right, you're wrong. It feels good temporarily, but research shows that prolonged anger is as bad for you as smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. We're going to try to feel good through bullying. By the way, educators, we still bully each other. Why is that? Well, bullying is when we try to off-put our pain onto somebody else. We're trying to get a sense of control in our lives. Why do we do drugs? We do drugs because we're trying to reduce our anxiety. We're trying to find connection through perhaps fitting in instead of the true belonging. We're trying to reduce pain. We're trying to get high. We're trying to feel good. Why do we join gangs and terrorist organizations? Again, we're looking for belonging. We're ultimately looking for love. We're going to try to feel good through those negative ways or through having positive and healthy relationships. We're going to feel good by being emotionally intelligent and resilient. We call that choosing love. We just want everyone to have a choice. Now I'm going to leave you with a message that Jesse left for his older brother. JT went into his bedroom following Jesse's murder and found a little note that Jesse had left for him, folded up on his desk. It said, have a lot of fun. Now this was a beautiful message from a little brother to a big brother, a little brother that was bouncing off the walls with fun all the time. But when I saw that, I realized that note was for all of us. What are the two most important things that we do on a daily basis? We choose love in all of our decisions and choices during the day because we're either choosing love or choosing fear and the outcomes of those look vastly different 
and have a lot of fun. Look, it's true, we don't say, hmm, pain and suffering, I think that I'll do that tomorrow between six and eight. Yeah, that's when that would be convenient for me. No, pain and suffering just come. Have you ever heard of the starfish story? So there's a little boy walking down the beach. He's picking up starfish and he's throwing them into the ocean. And there's an older man that's coming from the other direction. And he comes upon the boy and he says, little boy, what are you doing? And the little boy says, well, the tide's gone out and all these starfish are stranded. And unless I pick them up and throw them into the water, they're going to die. And the old man says, oh, little boy, I just came from the other way. There are tens of thousands of starfish all over this beach. If you worked all day, you wouldn't make a difference. The little boy bent down, picked up a starfish, threw it into the water and said, I made a difference with that one. And that's what you do every single day as educators. Your students are your starfish and don't ever forget that you are making a difference with each one. And I want to express my extreme gratitude. Thank you for everything that you do on a daily basis. I'm so excited for you to start to use the program or continue. If you have any questions, please let our team know. And I'm gonna leave you with this quote by Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you so much for choosing love.